have you ever felt out of place? Like you, you just didn't belong. Nobody said anything necessarily. Um, obviously, there's places you go sometimes people say things and you're like, oh, yeah, I feel out of place. But you ever been somewhere and, and nobody said anything, but you just felt like I don't belong there. Like I, I don't, this isn't, this isn't my group or, or my people. Um, I think if we're honest, we've all had that sense and that feeling. And, and Peter wants us to know that in some ways that should be the state in which we always live. We, we are not citizens, first and foremost, of this world, if we are believers. In some sense, we don't fit everywhere we go. Because in Lake City, I know where to go, and I know where not to go, right? But when I go visit Jacksonville or Atlanta, I may not have that information. I, I may not know, is this a safe neighborhood? Judging by my Airbnb selections, my wife would normally say, no, this is not a safe neighborhood, which is why you got such a good deal, right? <laughs> but, but you don't know that because you're, you're traveling. You're a sojourner moving through the land. You don't know the lay of the land. And, and so Peter is using this language to describe these Christians who are living throughout Turkey in Roman citizens or Roman cities as, as exiles or sojourners. And Peter then turns to how these sojourners, these exiles, should behave. How, how they should conduct themselves as believers. And these verses begin the second part. If you're doing a Bible study of First Peter, it's broken up into two sections. And this begins the shift from the first section to the second section. That the first part of First Peter is primarily theological, with an occasional little application to life. The second part, though, the second part is generally practical, with a, a, a little bit of theo theology sprinkled in here and there. So it's the exact opposite of the first part. The first part of First Peter contains these general exhortations to holiness, right, in verse 15 of chapter 1, to love in verse 22 of chapter 1, and to trust in God. But the second half, the second half gives very specific instructions showing how believers are to actually practice holiness, how we are to actually trust God in life situations. Now, lots of people like to tell you what holiness should look like based on what they think holiness should look like. And yet very few people actually bother to pay attention to what Peter says holiness should look like. Sadly, as we'll see next week, if the Lord gives us next week, many people will often tell you the opposite of what Peter tells you holiness should look like. So what is, what is Peter saying? Well, he, he starts with this verb, abstain. It's not a word we use every day. And, and, and this word means to keep away from or to avoid. And, and it gives us a sense of continually keeping away from sinful desires. In, in other words, we're not to let ourselves indulge them, those desires, at any time. Those, those passions of the flesh. Now, Peter's command suggests that our inner desires are not something that we cannot control this morning. He wouldn't tell us to do something we couldn't do, right? That's not how God works. So, so those inner desires can either be consciously nurtured or restrained. And this is important to realize because in our modern society that we live in, we, we often view our, our desires and our passions as kind of morally neutral. It's what we do with them. It's our actions. It's not how we're thinking. It's what we actually do with them. And Peter says, no, we, we need to control the desires, the passions of our hearts. We need to control our thought life. 
These sinful desires, Peter is telling us, they're waging war on our souls. And here, the, the, the present tense is a little technical, but the present tense of the verb gives the meaning which are continually waging war against your soul. I love the quote by John Owen that says, sin is either killing you or you're killing it. There's no in-between. There's no coasting in the Christian life. If you say, well, I'm just going to take a little break. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back a little bit. I'm just not going to do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, then it's killing you, my friend. You, you may think you're taking a break, but what's really happening is you are losing that war for your soul. Well, see, when we entertain these desires, and Peter knows this, th they may appear momentarily attractive and, and in themselves entirely harmless, right? Well, what's the problem with looking? I'm just looking. I'm not touching. I'm not talking to them. I'm just looking. But the longer we entertain those desires, the more they grow in our hearts. And eventually... Eventually, they will break forth into a wrongful desire, or a wrongdoing, right? Something that I say a lot is that sin always seeks to express itself in the extreme. It's not satisfied to just be a thought. It may start there, and it may live there for a little while, but eventually, if you keep nurturing it, if you keep fostering it, if you keep looking at that woman and going, man, she... She looks nice. She's so much nicer than my wife. She treats me so much better than my wife treats me. Or vice versa. Like, it, it, it's, it's a dangerous thing to sit there and think, There's, what's the harm in this? We're not doing anything yet. Yet. But if you keep nurturing those things, and Paul is telling, abstain from those passions of the flesh. You're, you're traveling through, you're a sojourner, you're in exile, you don't belong here. And one of the things that you have to do is abstain from those, those passions of the flesh because eventually they will make you spiritually weak and ultimately ineffective. This isn't just about you sinning, Peter is trying to get us to see this morning. That's bad in of itself. But because you're a sojourner, because you're an exile, because you're a representative of another kingdom, your actions begin to affect the witness of Jesus Christ. When we're unaware of the spiritual damage that these kinds of passions cause in our lives, it indicates a low level of spiritual maturity on our part. Now in verse 12, we... We, we have this positive counterpart to verse 11. Not only are we to abstain from sinful desires, but we are to continue to maintain good conduct among the Gentiles. Right? This isn't go hide away in the desert somewhere and wait for Jesus to come back. No, we're, we're to live our lives amongst the people that God has placed us. We are to conduct ourselves in a way that will bring honor and glory to our Savior. Because conduct here refers to our day-to-day -day pattern of life. Peter calls unbelievers Gentiles, not, not because he thinks that his readers are all Jewish Christians, but because he once again assumes that Christians, both literal Jews and literal Gentiles within the body of Christ, are now the true Israel. And to Peter, all who are not Christians are truly Gentiles. And before these unbelievers, we're to maintain a good conduct. So that one day, when they do speak evil against us, as a wrongdoer, they may see our good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. How many times have you guys experienced this where you're, you, you've been around a person whose conduct is not always the best? And then someone makes an accusation. Are you more likely to believe it because of their past conduct? Possibly, yeah. And what Peter is saying is the opposite. I want your conduct to be so good that when they do make an accusation against you, they look back and go, but all that person did is help people. He served the poor. He loved his brothers. 
He worked hard. I can't, I can't believe these accusations that you're making about him. Why? Because his day-to-day conduct glorified God. Sadly, too many today were not surprised because their day-to-day conduct betrays them. But Peter says our day-to-day conduct, when, when we live our lives in front of these Gentiles, it can lead to the salvation of the unbeliever. Peter has a very interesting evangelism strategy that is laid out in our passage here this morning. Now, one little side note on, on the way this verse ends it says on the day of visitation, and, and this is misleading because the, the definite article, again, a little technical here, the, the day of visitation, that's not there in the Greek. The the is not there. But there. So there's no definite article. So really, a better translation would be on a day of visitation. And on this day of visitation, the unbelievers who are currently slandering Christians will glorify God. The glorification here is almost certainly the voluntary praise of people who have been converted. This is not talking about the final judgment day, right? There's a little sidetrack there. But, but the, the point is this is not about one day in the future. This is about the day in which an unbeliever realizes, based on your conduct, their need for the gospel. And you say, okay, well, why is that? I would argue chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 gives you a specific illustration of that, which is part of this text, but I'm going to deal with it separately next week. There he says that a husband may be converted when they see the good conduct of their Christian wife. So that's a practical application of what he's saying here. And it's the same thing. So, So when unbelievers see our good conduct and they come to Christ, they give praise to God. As Christians living in a society that does not believe, Peter says, first, avoid sinful desires. Second, consistently exhibit excellent patterns of life, good conduct amongst the Gentiles, so that unbelievers may be saved, that God may be ultimately glorified. And and there's no reason for us this morning to doubt that Peter's strategy for evangelism would still work today. Again, as a reminder, just the context of this chapter is that we need to first put off all forms of evil. I preached about that two weeks ago. Second, as Brian told us last week, that we are chosen for this life, right? That, that, that we are bricks that are being built into this church. Man, this is so fun this morning. Um. And and as I warned you earlier on in this series, what Peter says we should do is very helpful. Or, Or excuse me, what Peter tells us to do is very difficult to do apart from the Holy Spirit empowering us to do it. So let's continue reading what he tells us to do. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil or to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Now, because we might think such extensive submission to authority would be oppressively restrictive, Peter explains that true freedom is consistent with obedience to God's will. He assures us that we can live as free men, but the kind of freedom meant is is not specified exactly here, but certainly the we we think about the great freedoms of the Christian life, right? We we are free from the impossible obligation of the law to, to earn merit 
before God by perfect obedience. We, we are free from the guilt that sin brings on our life because of what Christ has done for us. We are free from the ruling power of sin. We now have the ability to do something different that we didn't have before because of the empower, the empowering Holy Spirit in our lives. So we are free men. But Peter reminds us we don't have the freedom to then do wrong. We, we don't have the freedom to then go and sin. But he's asking us to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And I would argue that sometimes this is where we're a little bit more American than we are Christian. And, and don't get me wrong, I love America. I think overall it's one of the best countries in the world. But it's also a country founded on rebellion. Right? And that really speaks to a part of our heart, doesn't it? That, that rebel heart of ours. And we don't want anybody telling us what to do. And yet we have Peter telling us, through the Holy Spirit, to be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So the president, all the way down to the city council, county commissioners, that, that God has instituted those things. And if we are going to live a life that glorifies God, if we are going to be holy people, we are going to voluntarily subject ourselves to those human institutions that God has placed us in. Now, if God has you in Africa or Europe or somewhere else, you're going to have a different system, right? And, and if you're in a system where, say, for instance, there's a king and that king is a Christian king, that may be a better place to live as long as it's a Christian king, right? But God has called us to wherever we have been placed to submit ourselves to authority, Folks, this is one of the reasons why I think most people don't really understand what holiness looks like. Because we struggle with this. And yet, Peter is practically, what does being holy look like? It means submitting ourselves voluntarily to human institutions. What does trusting God look like? It means voluntarily submitting ourselves to human institutions. But if we're honest, we struggle with this, right? Those of you who are able to work, you, you struggle with the IRS, right? Forget the president. I don't want to give them our money. They don't know how to spend it. No, they don't. But that's no excuse for us to not submit to the human institutions that God has placed above us. So though we are free in a greater way than anyone can ever be free in Christ, we are still, in another sense, servants of God or slaves of God. Because we owe our whole lives, our whole being to him. And what is Peter asking us to do? Well, let's look at verse 17 specifically. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Now, this verse should be taken as four separate commands. The first is honor all men. And really, that means honor all people. Men is not in this in the Greek. It's all people. Okay. All is a common reference to all people generally. Consistent with their good conduct amongst, amongst unbelievers, Christians should be courteous and respectful to all people. Why? Well, theologically, 
Every person you meet is made in the image of God. And whether they are a believer or not a believer, they are still image bearers of the God we say we love. And therefore they are worthy of dignity and respect. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done. I told you holiness is hard. Because it's very easy for us to create a hierarchy of people that we honor and we don't honor. Based on things that they have done or not done. And yet Peter tells us to honor all people. Not just all male people. Not just all female people. All people. One commentator notes that the principle condemns much of man's treatment of his brothers, of his fellows, both in political, in the political and in the industrial world. We, we've just come out of a very contentious political season. Examine your own heart. Were you honoring all in that season? The second command is love the brotherhood. Now, love the brotherhood indicates a higher obligation to fellow Christians. Right? We're to, we're to honor all people, but we are to love the brotherhood. We're to love Christ's church. Not, not only are we to respect them, but to also show a strong, deep love to them. Third, we are to fear God. Now, fear in, indicates a still higher obligation. Fear, uh, Christians are not only to honor and love God, we are to do those things, but we are also to fear or be in awe of him is probably a better way to say that. Something we are never told to do toward unbelievers or believers. You are not to be in awe of me, and I am not to be in awe of you. I am only to be in awe of God. Whenever we start becoming in awe of people, we've just created an idol, whoever they are. We are only to be fearful or in awe of the living God. And then let's look at the fourth and final command. Peter now returns to the word honor. Notice that it's the same word that he began the verse with, right? Honor the emperor. And what is, I think, a little bit of irony here, Peter's saying? Um, Peter's put the emperor on the same level as all people. Now, you, again, it's hard for us to understand, but in a Roman society, the emperor was a god, he was worshipped as a God. He is who you were in awe of. And Peter's like, no, you, you guys got it wrong. You, you honor all people. You, you love the brotherhood, which is even more than honoring all people. And then you even more are in awe of God. And then we're going to go back to the beginning. And we, we're going to honor the emperor. We're not going to worship the emperor. We're not going to be in awe of the emperor. But we are going to honor the emperor in the same way that we would honor anyone around us. Christians have an obligation to the state, but their obligation to God and to other believers is higher than to the state. Now, Peter gives us some concrete examples of what he means. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, I want to remind you how illustrations often work, right? When I am speaking to you, and I'm trying to find an illustration to prove a point, I typically try to find a more extreme example, right? Because I, I want it to be clear to you what the person is saying, what the truth is. 
And that's exactly where Peter starts. He's like, let me give you the most extreme case. You're a slave. You are property of someone else. You belong to someone else. What does it mean to live out honoring all people? I told you, holiness is hard. Biblical holiness is difficult because Peter is telling us that, that we have to submit even in those cases where the person is unjust and harsh. Peter explains the reason for such submission in, verse, in part of verse 19. God is pleased when his people trust him in the midst of unjust suffering, imitating the example of Christ. So again, the first half of Peter, trusting God. What does it mean to really trust God? Are you really trusting God when everything is going your way? Are you really trusting God when your bank account's full and you're, you got the job that you've always wanted, your health is perfectly fine? Are you really trusting God? I don't know. But let those things flip upside down and your heart begins to get exposed rather quickly. You begin to see what you were really trusting in from the beginning. And so, again, Peter's using what I, what I think is a, a relatively extreme example to prove the point that even if this is your scenario, trust God. Submit to him. Because even in this submission, you are glorifying God if you are trusting in him. That the person who pleases God is the one who endures sorrows or grief while suffering unjustly. And Peter's emphasis here is on various kinds of, of, of mental anguish or sorrow, which can accompany unjust suffering. Yet he doesn't say that it is pleasing to God to merely endure unjust suffering and the accompanying sorrow. Instead, it's only... When that sorrow is endured while being mindful of God. Or, or more accurately, because we are conscious of God working in our lives. And I, I say that because sometimes I come across people who have, it's kind of like a, a stoic kind of belief, right? That, well, this is just the way it is and I just got to suck it up and I got to go through it. Not because I'm trusting God, but because this is just life. And life has its ups and downs, and this is a down, and I'll wait for an up. There's no glorifying God in that. It, it's only when we're in the down part that we are trusting and remembering God, that's when he is glorified. That whether I abase or abound, I am always going to worship God. It doesn't matter what my circumstances might look like in life. It's only when we are trusting and have an awareness of God's presence, of his never failing care. This is the key to righteous suffering. This morning, I don't know where you're at. You may be walking through something that's so difficult and so painful and maybe you've just resigned yourself. Well, this is just the way it is. I want to encourage you this morning. Instead, trust God. Trust him. Put your faith in him this morning. Submit yourself to whatever it is you're going through this morning. When you do that, you will glorify God. It's this confidence that that God will ultimately right all wrongs, that, that enables us to submit to an unjust master without rebelliousness, <laughs> self-pity, or despair. In verse 20, Peter makes explicit what he's implied in verse 19, namely that it's not just any kind of endurance through suffering that God approves, but endurance through unjust suffering. For what credit is it if when you do wrong, 
and are beaten for it, you take it patiently. <laughs> Peter's saying that this isn't when you go out and be stupid and then you go, okay, well, I got to accept the consequences of being stupid. Right? That, that's suffering justly. Like that was a just punishment that you received. But oftentimes as Christians, we are going to receive unjust criticism, unjust sufferings in our lives. Are you going to trust God with that? If you want to be holy, biblically holy, the answer is yes. Peter now uses suffered here rather than died in order to focus on Christ's life of suffering. And especially the suffering that's leading up to his death as a pattern to us as Christians. Peter's emphasizing that that Christ's obedience through unjust suffering was left as an example for us to imitate. Right? Christ could have been killed quickly, but instead we see this prolonged pattern of punishment all unjustly. Right? These soldiers who are beating him, putting a garment on him, and then ripping that garment off. Now, I don't know about you, but when they draw blood from me, it normally takes a lot of times to draw blood. And I tell the ladies all the time, listen, I can sit here and let you do this nine times to me. Three different nurses because they can only stick you three times. That's what happened last time. I said, but listen, if you put nine pieces of tape on these arms, that is way worse than what you're doing with that needle. Right? Can you imagine being beaten with a cat of nine tails and then someone putting a coat on you and your blood dries? to that coat, and then they rip it off of you? This is the unjust suffering that our Lord and Savior endured for us. That that is the pattern and the example. You say, but Dale, my suffering is so hard. Really? Compared to what Christ did on the cross for you? When he did nothing wrong? Peter wants us to see that example of Christ's obedience through all of the unjust suffering as an example for us this morning to imitate. An example of the kind of life that is perfectly pleasing in God's sight. When suffering unjustly, trusting in God and obeying him can be a challenge. But these aspects are are, deepen through undeserved affliction. And God is glorified more fully as a result of us enduring and trusting him through whatever that suffering looks like this morning. He goes on in verse 21, for this you have been called. (laughs) Right? Brian had that great message last week. You're a chosen people. Here's what you're chosen for. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter ends our text this morning by reminding us that we have a Savior that set the example for all of us. When we suffer through whatever kind of mental suffering and anguish we go through while still trusting God, we are imitating Jesus this morning. And I want you to think for just a second about how this played out in Rome. This was Peter's evangelism strategy for these Christians. At this point in time, they're being drugged into arenas and being killed. But they continued to go. They continued to praise God. 
They continued to trust God amidst the suffering. And what happened to Rome? It changed. It changed. Because Christianity kept growing despite the suffering. We see this today in modern day China. Where oftentimes to be caught going to a Christian worship service means you're going to prison. They, they joke. There's a joke amongst Chinese Christians. They ask, where did you go to seminary? What they mean by that is, what prison did you go to? Because that's their prolonged extended time away with God. It's not going to some college campus, it's going to prison. And learning how to completely trust in God in that prison. Where they are unjustly beaten by guards just for being a Christian. And yet the church is continuing to grow and thrive. Why? Why? Because they are trusting God through the suffering. What Peter is calling this church to do in modern day Turkey, turn the Roman Empire upside down. And the same thing can happen here in this country if we start trusting God through our suffering. If we stop trying to demand everybody do the things that we want them to do the way we want them to do them. And instead, we trust God. Now, listen, we live in a country where you're allowed to vote. Please vote your conscience. Vote God's law into the law. Please. Don't mishear me. This is not a passive pull out, go live in the desert. That is not what Peter is advocating here. If you're going to be a citizen, be a good citizen. Good citizens vote. Good citizens do their research before they vote. Right? Be a good citizen. But at the end of the day, no matter what the results say, you submit to that human authority, that human institution. Because ultimately, we're not submitting to a person so much as we are submitting to an institution that God has placed over us. And then trust him. Trust him. And follow him. And let me close with just three quick pieces of application this morning that kind of jumped out to me as I was preparing this week. First, none of us can excuse our poor work or sinful behavior at work by blaming it on the treatment that you receive from your boss. Now, Peter's using the example of a household slave, and I know in America we tend to think American slavery. But oftentimes in Rome they were paid. You would have doctors who were slaves. You would have you know, professionals who were slaves. And they were paid for their work. Okay, So it's, it's much more like an employer especially at this time in Roman history, most of the slaves were born into slavery. So you and I, and, and I hear people complain about this all the time. It's like, well, you don't know my boss and my boss is so bad. And, and that's, I just, you know, we have no excuse because we don't work for men. We work for God. It, it doesn't matter Who's put over us? Ultimately, God is over him or her. And that's who we work for. Our conscience should always be focused on God with our work. Second, most of our problems in our lives come from being self-oriented rather than being focused on belonging to God. Let me say that again. Most of our problems in our lives come from being self-oriented, self-focused, rather than being focused on belonging to God. When we're self-focused, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. When we're focused on belonging to God, it's all about what he wants. 
And when we find ourselves having a pity party about the way life is treating us, we've lost focus on the fact that our lives are not our own. We need to recognize that when we do this, just like Israel did over and over and over again in the Old Testament, that's why we have all those stories, we're failing in our purpose and must quickly repent. Right? Israel's purpose was to point the nations to God. And yet they failed over and over and over and over. Why? Because they became self-focused. It became about them instead of what they were to be doing. Third and final thought that you should take from this text. Your behavior is observed. Someone is watching all the time. I hear people say, well, nobody cares what I do. You're wrong. I'm here to tell you, Peter's here to tell you, you're wrong. Somebody in some way is observing what you do. And what they are seeing, Peter says, is either leading them closer to God or farther away from God. No one lives for themselves. Peter said that there is so much writing on our behavior. And this morning, it's my job to remind you of that. If you're a parent here this morning, your kids are watching. Even when you think they're not. They often hear all the things you wish they wouldn't have heard. A lot's riding on our behavior. We need to conduct ourselves in a good way amongst the Gentiles. And some of you have a bunch of Gentile kids living with you that need Jesus. Some of you work with a bunch of Gentiles who need Jesus. Some of you are going to be having Thanksgiving with a bunch of Gentiles who need Jesus. Make sure, and again, this, this is not something you do in your own power. <laughs> you, I would even argue you cannot do this in your own power. You need the Holy Spirit to help you to trust God no matter what the circumstances you're in right now. Trust the human institu institutions that you have been placed under and suffer the way your Savior suffered. Even if it's unjust, continue to honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, Let's pray, Father. As we come to your table this morning, I know this week I've been convicted of all the ways that I have failed to submit myself to authority. The, the human authorities that you have placed over me, I failed to pray for them, uh, if nothing else. But God, in, in so many other ways, I have not honored all of the people that you have placed in government. And Father, I pray that you would continue to convict our hearts this morning so that we might confess and repent and come to the table celebrating the unjust suffering that Jesus partook in for our salvation. And Lord, while we may never be able to completely confess and repent of every one of our sins, I pray that as we come this morning, we come with a heart that is worshipful, that we are thankful that Jesus did what we couldn't do. And though we have failed, that is not a, not a reason to not come and celebrate what Jesus has already done. 
And Lord, I pray that you would help us to love the brotherhood, to honor all people, and to be in fear or awe of you every day of our lives while also honoring the human institutions that you have put in our lives. And Father, I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.